In this next series of screencasts, we will look at single source shortest paths algorithms. In this particular screencast, we're going to introduce the ideas about shortest paths and some properties of the relaxation procedure that's used in the algorithms. And as we're approaching the topic, we're being investigated by some kind of a booby. I don't know if it's a brown booby or a variant or immature, red footed or blue footed, but we're approaching their island, Lisiansky in Papahanao Mokuakea National Monument. Shortest paths are defined on directed weighted graphs. So we'll have the usual graph definition and a weight function, which is defined on the edges of the graph, but we'll extend its definition to be a weight function on a path, the path weight WP, and we'll define a path in terms of a sequence of vertices. So the path weight will simply be the sum of all the edges, the weights on all the edges connecting the vertices in the path. So to define the shortest path weight from u to v, we have this delta function here, which is going to be the minimum of all the weights of the paths between u and v if there exists at least one path, and otherwise we'll define it to be infinite. So a shortest path from u to v is any path such that the weight of that path is this minimum. So delta is always the minimum, w is the actual weight of a given path, delta is always the minimum between two vertices. You need to keep those two things straight. And we say a shortest path because there can be more than one. The fact that shortest paths are not unique can be seen in these two examples. The same graph, we've got two different paths. Uh, first, let's note that we always start from S, the source. These are the same graph. And we're going to write the, the delta values, the shortest uh, distance to the vertex inside the vertices. During the run of an algorithm, we might write the estimates of delta. We'll get into that later. Um, and here we can see that there's uh, shortest paths from S to T to X going that way at a cost of 9. But you can also go from S to T to Y to X at a cost of 9. So shortest paths are not unique. There are variations on the shortest paths problem. We're considering the single source shortest paths problem from a single source S to every vertex in V. One might want to do a single destination from every vertex V to some D, but this can be solved simply by reversing the links and treating it as a single source problem. Now you might want to have only one destination. You know, you're trying to get from LA to Indianapolis or whatever, and you don't care about how long it takes to get to Seattle. Uh, but every known algorithm to solve the single pair shortest paths problem takes just as long as solving the single source. Why might that be the case? Well, think about how can you guarantee that you've found the shortest path to some destination city unless you've checked out the alternate routes. You don't know whether you might get there cheaper through an alternate route, so you have to check them all out. Finally, there's the all pairs problem, which we will cover in the next series of um, screencasts, and it's the next chapter of the uh, Corman et al. textbook. Now we have to consider whether the weights on the edges can be negative. So in this example here, we have some negative weight edges. But let's look at the effect of that. If we find a path from S to A to B, what's the cost of that path? Well, it's 3 plus negative 4, which is negative 1. And then via that path, we can get to G, add 4 to that at a cost of 3. I'll set that aside because that may not be the cheapest way. We have to check out this other route. Uh, so negative weights aren't really a problem as long as you don't have a cycle. You just you know add them up. In other words, you know subtract the absolute value and uh, whatever you get in the end is whatever the cost is. Now what about a cycle? Well here we have negative 3 and 6 in a cycle so if I go 5, 6 it costs me 11 to get here but I can then subtract 3 so that's 8 but then I add 6 that's going to cost even more so 11 is the correct estimate to here and then of course we add 8 to get 19 to here which is 
doesn't belong in there because the three is better. Okay, so we'll put the, uh, the three in there. So that's not a problem either because no matter, when you go around this cycle here, you're just adding values. The weight on the cycle is positive. Negative three plus six is three. So looping around the cycle won't cause a problem. But what about over here? Well, this subgraph here has a cycle with a negative weight and actually the cycle itself sums to less than zero. It's called a negative weight cycle. But this particular one is not a problem because it's not reachable from S. And all these vertices will be assigned initial estimate infinity and they will never be changed. So this won't cause a problem. Now, suppose that one of these was S. Suppose that this was S here. You can see what the problem would be. That as we went around the loop, Say we got 2, 3, that gives us 5, negative 8. We've gotten over here with, with a cost of negative 3. And then you keep going, 2, 3, 5, negative 8. Now it's negative 6. And you can keep lo looping and then end up with an infinitely negative cost. So that's no good. Negative weight cycles make the uh, shortest paths ill-defined. So here's the example in the text where the negative weight cycle is in the original graph starting with s, you can go 2 and then 3, negative 6, and you can keep cycling, keep cycling, so we would have to define this as being a, a negative value. And now some algorithms can detect negative weight cycles and others can't, and we're going to see that when we do the next two screencasts. But if neg weight, negative weight cycles are present, the, the length of the path is not well defined, and so we say we can't compute the shortest paths when one is present. So an algorithm might detect it and say, sorry, you can't do it on this graph. It won't give you the answer you're hoping for, but it will tell, at least tell you that. Other algorithms will simply go wrong, and we'll see that Bellman Ford can handle them. Dijkstra's cannot. So what about cycles in general? We've just ruled out negative weight cycles, but are cycles bad in general? Well, if you have a positive weight cycle, you can keep looping around it, and just adding more and more value and that will will not make the path any shorter it'll be long it'll just get more expensive and more expensive um, so it can't be a shortest path in a cycle so it turns out our algorithms are not going to you know, allow positive, positive weight cycles to be included uh, but they're not a problem to have them in the graph uh, zero weight cycle in theory one could go around these things as many times as one wants and the path length still remains the same but since that doesn't affect the cost, and that's usually not what we intend when we use a graph to model a problem, we're going to assume that solutions don't use them. Finally, an important thing about this problem, optimal substructure. This is a property of the problem, not of the algorithm. Um, this problem exhibits optimal substructure, which means that any optimal solution, the global solution, must contain within it optimal solutions to the subproblems out of which that global solution is constructed. And remember, we proved this with cut-and-paste arguments. And it turns out that uh, because this problem exhibits optimal substructure, both remember that that means both greedy algorithms and dynamic programming need optimal substructure, so they may apply. Of course, you have to meet their other requirements. Greedy algorithms have to have the greedy choice property, and dynamic programming, you need to have overlapping subproblems for it to be worthwhile. And it turns out that we get both of these. Dijkstra's algorithm that we're going to look at for uh, single source shortest paths is greedy. And then when we do all pairs shortest paths, we will see a dynamic programming solution. Well, I've just claimed that this has optimal substructure, but I didn't prove it yet. Here's a brief proof. And w the way we're going to state it is that any subpath of a shortest path is a shortest path. That, of course, is optimal substructure because it means the optimal solution, the shortest path, has as its subproblem solutions also shortest paths. So it's a usual cut and paste proof. Let's say this is a path P between P, U, and V is a shortest path that includes these various subpaths, including uh, P, X, Y, which we'll discuss in a minute. So because this is a shortest path, the weight of that path is also the optimal weight. The delta U, V means the weight of the shortest path between them. And because of the way it's constructed here, it's the sum of these three paths. Now let's suppose that this was not true. We're going to do the proof by contradiction. Let's suppose that uh, there was a subpath that was not a shortest path. So let's say PXY is that subpath that's not a shortest path. 
and uh, because there exists a p prime x y that's shorter. So the weight of p prime x y is less than p x y. So the cut and paste argument is, of course, you put p prime x y into there instead of p x y, and then that means the weight of the whole path that includes p prime, this whole thing, has a term that's smaller, as we stated here, than the term before. So that means the weight of the whole path has to be less than the weight of that path, and that contradicts our assumption that PUV was the shortest path. So this problem has optimal substructure. And given the problem has optimal substructure, we can consider problem-solving strategies that require optimal substructure. Before we go on, a brief look at the coral around Lysiansky. I was not allowed to go on the island due to quarantine restrictions, but spent considerable time in the water here for a couple of days. This is a finger coral, a parietes species, a very large cluster. And these are what are known as um, mushroom corals, fungia. And of course there's quite a few fish up there. And I hope you'll stay with me for the next screencast because the coral gets very beautiful and where we went diving the next day. So in the second half of this screencast we look at uh, some basics of the algorithm is going to use, some utility procedures, and here some of the basic attributes that they use. Uh, first of all, we got v dot d is the shortest path estimate, the current distance estimate. That's what the d is for. So initially we estimate, of course, to be infinity, and we reduce it as we find shorter ways to get to the vertex. Uh, you know, you may have um, from s, you may find some path that gets you the v at some cost c, and then you may later on find some other path that gets you at some cost uh, d less than c, and then you update the cost. Uh, so that's how that works. And we always maintain the fact that it is, uh, it's an upper bound on the actual shortest path cost. And what we want to show is when the algorithm concludes that it is identical to the shortest path cost. v dot pi is the usual predecessor pointer to the last vertex that we reach this from. So for example, v dot pi here would be set to that vertex until we found a better path, and then it would be set, set to that vertex. So if there's no predecessor, v dot pi is going to be nil. And of course, we also want to show at the conclusion of our algorithms that v dot pi is pointing to the predecessor on the shortest path. And so then pi will induce a shortest path tree from s that will be various paths to all the other vertices in the graph. Now all of the algorithms use these two helper procedures. We're going to start with this initialized single source and it will do the usual things for each vertex setting the distance to nil, the parent, the distance to infinity, the parent to nil, and the start vertex of course has a distance of zero. And then there's the extremely important relaxation function. This is called when we have when, when we are at u and we can take an edge to v and we want to ask can we improve the shortest path estimate for v by going through u and following that edge. So we call it with u, v, and the weight function and we say we've got our current uh, estimate of the cost to u, the distance to u, and we know the weight on the edge, so the cost to follow that edge add those two together, that's the cost of getting to v via u, and so if that's less than how we got to v before, which may be infinite or may be some other cost that we found through some other real path, then we update it. We say v's new cost estimate, v dot d, is what we just computed above, and v's new predecessor is u, because we found a better way to get to v. So here's two examples here. One is we, our current uh, v dot, or u dot d is 4. We found a way to get to u by 4. And we see an edge of cost 3 to v, and v currently has an estimate of 10. But 4 plus 3, here 4 plus 3 is less. And so we're, let's relax it, and we'll assign this to be 7 instead of 10. Here's another example we might call it, and find that we've already gotten to v a cheaper way. So after the relax, nothing changes. So both of the algorithms we look at will call relax, and they will differ in their strategies for in what order they call relax on the edges. We'll wrap up with a summary of important properties 
of the shortest paths al algorithms when we use initialize single source to initialize the data structure and do a sequence of relaxation of relax calls. So the triangle inequality says that if you have the delta SV is a distance, the shortest distance to V, then by adding an edge from U to V, you can't get any less. It has to be greater than or equal to. You might wonder why can't you, doesn't negative weight edges screw this up? Why can't you have a negative weight edge here that makes this actually be less than? So let's look at S and we've got a vertex U and a vertex V and there's some path going to U that has weight delta SU and there's some other path going to V that has delta SV and here's the W. Well if this had a negative weight on it that was able to make this plus this less than that then this would not have been the weight of the shortest path. Remember this is delta. This is not the weight of some particular path. This is the weight of the shortest path. So if there was a way to get there cheaper that's what this value would be. Okay let's move on. Upper bound property. This is saying that the uh, distance estimate will always be an upper bound on the actual distance and once you achieve that actual distance it never changes. It never drops below. And by the way, these properties each can be proven using the ones, some combination of the ones before them. And there's a long uh, section in the book that does the proofs. The no pa path property, well, if there is no path, it's always going to stay infinite because there's no way to reduce it. Convergence property. If we have some path from S to V where the last step taken is U, and that's the shortest path, then whenever the estimate of the cost to you becomes its lowest cost any time after that when you relax edge uv then that will be updated to the correct shortest cost so if you get to here by the the lowest cost then when you relax that edge this will have the lowest cost too now the path relaxation property is kind of like an inductive extension of that it's going to say if we have a path of edges from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, dot, 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 k minus 1 to k. And if we relax those edges in that order, when we're done, this last vertices distance will be its shortest path value. And this property holds even if you insert into here lots of other insertions. As long as you happen to hit these things in that sequence, this property will hold. This is an important one for um, proving correctness of our algorithms. Finally, the predecessor subgraph property simply says that once you've got the shortest path distance recorded as the distance estimate for all the vertices, the graph uh, constructed by following the pi pointers is, uh, the predecessor pointers, is the shortest path tree. In other words, all the paths from the vertices to S will be the shortest paths. Well, that concludes our introduction to single source shortest paths, and we'll leave the monk seals sleeping on the beach for the day, and we'll be back soon to look at the Bellman Ford and Dijkstra's algorithms.